start out just broadly um, here. If I think, I think I can make it move. Maybe there it goes. All right. So uh, this is from a CDC report um, in June of June data. It's actually in August. I think is when it was reported, but uh, it's from data in June. And it's really just comparing not necessarily a diagnosis or major depressive disorder or anxiety disorders, but of uh, the ratio of symptom reports and it compared it uh, to last year. Uh, and so not surprising, I don't know if there's any shocker here that we are seeing increased um, depression, uh, anxiety, uh, and even some suicidal ideation increases uh, as far as thoughts go um, across the board, um, pretty much um, pretty generally um, four times more for depression. As you can see anxiety three times more and suicidal thoughts. And, and that, that was fairly significant suicidal uh, ideation. So not just passive, that was pretty active, um, was the requirement for, for that, uh, that uh, in the study. So that's pretty increased. And then also, I think, uh, also not surprisingly, a pretty substantial increase uh, in substance use. So people are dealing uh, with, with stress, and it's one of the ways that people do deal with stress is through substances. And then also people are isolated more uh, and at home. And, and I think uh, there's, there's pretty, uh, pretty good data and pretty significant issue, issues with substance use increases uh, in, in across the country. Uh, this did break down a little bit into different groups, and this is more along the lines of what I see. Uh, you know, I see, I see kids and families every day, uh, some of which are really struggling um, and, and struggling uh, in a lot of areas uh, that are related to COVID, uh, and some that really aren't. And so uh, there's definitely some differences uh, in circumstances. And, and the more significant groups here with young adults, uh, essential workers, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, and, and unpaid adult caregivers, which I think we don't uh, appreciate maybe uh, some of us don't appreciate uh, how much they are a part and, and critical uh, to, to many families across the country uh, and playing a greater role and, and are often themselves at greater risk uh, and taking on greater stress uh, than they're used to and, and uh, prepared for uh, in the circumstances, especially with schooling and things like that. And I think, uh, I think that's a, a group that in uh, a, a situation that definitely um, is impacted greatly. Um, this is more specific for children and adolescents. This is, these are studies from, from global, a uh, different a variety of studies from different uh, countries, uh, but there is also showing consistently increased uh, anxiety and depression um, and uh, much greater in, in families that have been impacted by, directly by the illness and COVID. And so there's a big difference. And I see it too in the, in the families I work with and, and uh, help uh, in, in those, those uh, families that have been impacted and had a family member or had the whole family in many cases have COVID. Uh, it's a different experience and a very much, a very much different stress, uh, I think that, that those families go through than, than what um, many are going through just generally with the stress of getting it, the stress of uh, the changes in society as a result. Um, surprisingly, I, this number was a little high, I thought for me, but, but maybe not. 86% of parents uh, reported seeing clear behavioral changes uh, in kids, um, and so decreased concentration, irritability, restlessness were some of the big ones. Loneliness is one I think that I, I would uh, kind of emphasize here. There's a lot of studies uh, in child psychiatry and, and psychology about loneliness, and loneliness really uh, is one of the symptoms that can, in kids that can uh, be associated with increased uh, risk of major depressive disorder and, and longer term consequences. Um, psychologically. So I, I think that's one to, to be aware of, obviously, that is the kids are, are much more likely to experience at this time and really um, find ways and challenge uh, ourselves in trying to, to safely um, uh, alleviate that loneliness uh, and break up the, the kind of isolation of, of the days for some kids. But also, I think it's really important uh, to focus on uh, parents too. So, uh, you know, we talk, we think about uh, kids, um, but I think we, we, uh, it's really important to focus on uh, what parents are going through because they are really, I think, in a position of, of great stress. Uh, they have a lot. They're trying to um, maintain uh, income, maintain jobs, um, juggle schools, juggle. Um, uh, dealing with kids with a lot less support. So a lot of family members and grandparents aren't necessarily uh, as uh, available or as active or, um, or trying to protect themselves. And I think, um, so that's, there's a, just a great increase uh, of stress in, in adults and parents, and that's passed on to kids. Um, and so it is often, uh, you know, if we're under a great deal of stress, our, our kids sense it and react to it and, um, and it puts them uh, at greater stress uh, as well. Um, this study also, not surprisingly, really isolated uh, parents who are struggling with um, 
other things in this the loss of childcare, delay in healthcare visits, uh, food security, um, and also those folks that are single family folks, uh, which is what I see a lot of, uh, are really, um, and those parents are really stressed uh, in to extremes in some cases. Uh, and, and folks that already have mental health struggles uh, are just magnified. Uh, those issues are magnified uh, when they're dealing with all these other stressors. Um, it really can exacerbate their illness and their, their um, pre-existing uh, struggles. Uh, young children, also families with young children were under, uh, in the study, uh, were under a bit more stress and expressed a lot more stress than, um, than others. I think also, as we talk about kind of stress and anxiety and depression, I think bereavement is something that um, we can't ignore. So uh, obviously the number of deaths is, is climbing and a number that gets us some attention, but uh, the impact of that on families, uh, I think is, it can obviously be enormous. And I think in a situation like this, and, and there's a, a you know, growing kind of recognition of it, that this is an illness um, that you bring home. Um, so someone gets it uh, and they spread it uh, in the home because that's the, in some ways some of the easiest and closest contact that we have and that's how it's spread. Uh, and then the tracers come and figure out who brought it home and who, who got it and why and, and where and because they've got to figure out who else to warn. Uh, and it becomes uh, very much something that you've given uh, to the people you love. And so the consequences of survivor guilt uh, and, uh, and among family members is very severe and really leads to and in, in com commonly re results in more complex grief uh, and more longstanding issues with grief and guilt and uh, other uh, issues like depression. And so uh, this is unique in, in a sense of, of kind of the causal uh, and the relational nature uh, of, of what happens and how it plays out amongst families and, and people in close community and close connection. So uh, I think that's, that's a, a something that we're gonna see uh, and a kind of track and experience and, and have more, unfortunately, probably um, understanding of the severity of those consequences over time. It's hard to, hard to um, stay right now, but certainly it's being expressed. This is a quote uh, down there from uh, a, a psychiatry professor at the University of Michigan. Michigan uh, that I thought was pretty, um, I think we just don't know. And I think it's pretty, uh, pretty true. I think we're going to find that these consequences are going to be very important uh, and very impactful uh, for kids going forward and for families going forward. Um, so I guess a little bit of this is uh, a question of what do we do and how do we get through this? Uh, and I don't have the answers. <laughs> I have some suggestions and these are pretty broad. Um, and I think it's, it's a lot of community and it's a lot of support in a time when community and support, as I just said, is, is a little bit tougher because it's more distant, but we are at a time um, technologically like, like this, that we can um, it, you know, communicate and interact um, even from a distance. And I think uh, making uh, maximum use of that, connecting um, folks together, is really important. And so I think uh, we have some, some advantages now versus uh, 30 years ago, or four years ago, or certainly in 1918, uh, you know, where you know, we, we can um, be creative and, and really deal with some things in, in ways that uh, minimize uh, our isolation in times when we need to isolate for safety, for, especially for some vulnerable folks. Um, these are some tips generally, obviously some of these are, are directed kind of towards families um, but I think they're gener they're helpful for us kind of as a, a church community and as just as a community as a whole uh, to kind of look at too. So for example, the first one is, is maintain a sense of routine. Uh, this is just good advice for anxiety for kids. So they have a sense of what's coming. They have a sense of predictability. Uh, they have a sense of, of in some way security from, um, uh, from uncertainty. And so that's really helpful. But I think as a community, I think we've, we've maintained a church community, we've maintained some sense of routine. Uh, there's still church every Sunday, and there's still Sunday school every Sunday, and there's still events uh, that the church has that we go to from time to time. And I think those kind of things are, are helpful um, to have, uh, to keep in place and to find ways to do, even if they're different. Um, and so that, uh, that sense of routine, that sense of presence uh, and, and predictability uh, is important. It's also important as far as routines go, it's not just events, or it's also kind of routines we do for safety here. Uh, in a time like this. So kids are learning to wear masks uh, and, and learning to, uh, to take precautions and stay distant. Uh, and it's really helpful to have set just routines that aren't thought of. So you're not stressing about every moment or stressing about every interaction. You've thought through what those interactions are gonna look like. You've set forth a, a safety, uh, a safe way of doing it, a safe way of moving forward. So 
kids uh, don't have to stress about what happened or what they did. Um, they did what they were, what the plan was, uh, and it was successful. And it's helpful to reassure during interactions with kids that you're doing a great job keeping that mask on, or if you see it drifting down a little bit or something, um, help them out uh, so that they can uh, walk away with a sense of security uh, as much as possible. Obviously, there's some risk in all of our interactions, but uh, giving them some some sense of control uh, over something that is out of everyone's control, out of our country, country's control right now, clearly, you know, is is really helpful. Um, and that's that's one of the, the cores of dealing with anxiety is control what you can and have a sense of of success in that. And so that that can be really helpful. Um, sleep is critical. I think for all of us, that's that's not just for kids and adolescents, but I think that's for adults. Uh, I tell, I, I do see some adults, even though I focus mainly on kids, I, you know, I, I my advice is to, to take the phone, put it away, not, a, not accessible, you know, ring her off, all that kind of stuff so that you can really protect sleep time. And I think that's even more important in, in really anxious times because you can get down a rabbit hole of worry and of stuff uh, and also and sometimes have trouble getting to sleep and that stuff only uh, makes it worse. Um, you give kids control when possible, so choice over their activity, um, some control over their masks and, and you know, kind of get comfortable uh, with those kind of things, I think is pretty helpful. Um, and just, you know, you don't give them control over everything necessarily. You still got to have, you know, expectations and boundaries and, and things. But when there is uh, some sense uh, that they can pick things, I think that's really helpful. Um, preparing them for what they're going to see. So if they haven't been out uh, and seen a lot of people in masks, I think that's kind of one thing, or, or what the differences are going to be at the doctor's office, or explain them to them when they get there. So it's not something that they're wondering about, not something they're stressing about. Um, it's something that, that they can understand, uh, and um, that understanding gives them a, a sense of security as well. Uh, also, uh, it's in you know in times of, of stress, reviewing uh, positives of the day, especially if there is a lot of negatives in a family that's undergoing uh, family member with COVID or, or uh, significant economic struggles right now, um, really focus on the, the things that they can remember and hold on to that were really good about the day, some simple things. Um, I mean, I, I, if you, one example I guess I can think of personally is uh, my, my, I played tag with my daughter the other day and, you know, that was maybe 20 minutes of the day and the rest of the day was different stuff and a lot of screen time and things, but what does she remember and what does she cherish at the end of the day when, when we're saying goodnight or something is, is the tag and the interaction. And I think um, really emphasizing those things so that um, those are the things, the community, the, the connection, the um, that it's not the, the outside stress and things that we can't control. It's really these things uh, togetherness and, and those positives um, that uh, I think are work, help those be the memories and those be the things that they're focused on and not the external stressors, which are uh, often extreme. Um, you know, one of the things too is just advice is to listen to kids and listen to folks. It doesn't have to be kids, anybody. Uh, you don't always have to fix it, even though there's a huge urge. Uh, and I think I have trouble with this at times. Uh, but just, you know, people under enormous stress and just being present to validate that uh, and to hear it uh, and to experience it with them a bit uh, is huge. Um, there's some things we can't control. Um, there's, there's some things that are that we can't fix. Um, and then there's some things we can help with, but also just letting them have the emotion and expressing it and giving them a safe place to do it is, uh, is really helpful. Um, Pray, giving praise to kids is helpful when they're uh, taking safety precautions so they can feel comfortable with it. Uh, and then I mentioned earlier, just strategies to combat lo loneliness. It's, it's, you know, you do the best you can with, uh, with, with friends for kids and, with, um, and make time for interactions with other adults. Um, excessive screen time really can increase isolation, the sense of it. At the end of the day, if you've been on a screen all day without other people or playing video games, there's just the day ends with the sense of loneliness. There's nothing you carry from that, kind of like the, the game of tag, I guess I referenced earlier. And so it is important uh, to make sure that there is uh, structured time and interactions and really parents, it's helpful to set aside time from their own busy, stressful, uh, overloaded uh, time to, to get to it and do it. Um, let's see here, let's see if I can, there we go. So uh, another thing, you know, kind of just generally, what can we as a community do for folks is be alert. So when we see somebody struggling, um, when we uh, when we sense that kids are are you know having uh, behavioral differences or changes, um, recognize it and say something uh, and be present and, and ask if you can help. And, and also, um, 
you know, not be afraid to say, hey, hey, you know, I know someone or I know somewhere you can get some help um, and, and really normalize uh, and, and make that a safe thing to ask for. Um, because I think a lot of folks avoid it and, and think, oh, it'll go away, it'll get better. Uh, but um, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of stuff that, that needs to get addressed and some kids can, uh, obviously we're dealing with some increased suicidal thoughts and severe um, symptoms and circumstances. And so it's really helpful for those folks to really, to get the treatment and get a scene um, with professionals. Um, and there's a lot of availability of that uh, in all kinds of different ways right now too, even on screens. And even if, if it's not real uh, accessible financially, there's a lot that, uh, that can be done, so. Uh, I think in just in general in our interactions with kids uh, is project a sense of calm. Uh, they pick up on our anxieties of the world and our anxieties of the day and our anxieties of, of circumstances. And so um, they often distort it, magnify it uh, for us to, to have things planned out and project a sense of control, a sense of calm um, is, is really helpful for them um, in these, especially when they're uh, kind of, if they're anxious, um, about what's going on and circumstances. Um, it's good for us to model safe behavior. Um, and even if it's unnecessary at times, the modeling of behavior is really helpful. So, um, and that's a little bit what I meant by, you know, not necessarily re revisiting every moment. Look, if you're wearing a mask, you're wearing a mask, uh, you know, even if you get further away and you could probably take it off in some ways with kids, just just be consistent with it um, so, that, so they can not have to worry about what to do every moment. Um, and that can be helpful. This is a, a little bit of a mnemonic that was um, that was in uh, a lot of, touched in a couple of different places that I found online, a couple of different psychiatry um, websites, and so it covers a lot of what we already covered um, about how to deal with kids and how to get them through um, some stressful moments and, and, and stress, uh, especially today. One of the things mentioned here is media exposure. So uh, there's a, a lot of um, uh, it's, it's, it's just we're bombarded with it and certainly we're for a while, especially on the number of deaths and the number of cases and, and all of that can be very overwhelming to kids. And sometimes it's not that they don't need to know, um, but they just you know, limit their exposure to the constant um, kind of uh, rolling in of information and fear, uh, a scary uh, information um, and, not, and, and reassure them of what you're doing and, and how you're being safe um, in, in those times. Uh, and routines and, and educating them about safe habits is important. And then I guess the final thing I kind of wanted to, to emphasize is despite all of this, because that's a lot of heavy stuff in some ways, and and look, I think we are, and we are seeing a great increase in requests for mental health services, um, but kids are resilient. Um, so we know this from uh, from studies of war and, and really uh, horrific uh, tragedies that, that uh, well, I don't want to minimize this, um, but for many, for many, this will be a temporary transient experience that was stressful, um, but not necessarily um, as traumatic as, as what many kids will go through. And many kids will go through very traumatic circumstances with this uh, if they lose a family member or uh, they get sick themselves and, and have significant uh, hospitalization or illness. Uh, and so, you know, for many, um, they, we, we will get through this and, and not be uh, worse for it in some ways, uh, you know, can be a positive thing. So uh, it, there's a lot of families I deal with that really have had uh, increased family connectedness and cohesion as a result of the time together and things. And so um, it's very different how kids um, are experiencing this and families are experiencing this. Um, and some, and, and generally kids are going to be resilient. Um, one of the major factors for good outcomes in trauma is supportive relationships, which obviously the church community is uh, for families and for kids. And this is true for parents as well, much lower rates of, of post-traumatic stress disorder in those that I identified to have a positive support network outside of their immediate family. And so that's a, one way that we as a church exist uh, and support those certainly in our community, but also uh, even beyond our church community. Um, we can find ways to, to be uh, present for folks and, and to be involved with folks and, and be helping out. Um, but that is, uh, you know, one of the things that we uh, can do to really help kids um, get through this and get through this as healthy as possible. Um, so that's kind of the, the overview I have. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I guess I'll take some questions and, and uh, kind of go from there if I can figure out how to unshare. Perfect. I didn't know if you were yeah. seeing my signals. So yeah, I got it. I, <laughs> I should have maybe winked at you or something. Sure. Are there any questions? If you want to unmic yourself and ask a question. 
or if you want me to unmic you, maybe I can unmic everybody. Uh, there's a way to do it. <clears throat> Brian, I have a question. Yes. So during Sunday school, um, do you feel that it's okay to talk with the kids how they're feeling about COVID? I, I think so. I, um, I, I, I look. I think it's helpful to for kids to have a place to express concerns and emotions. So, uh, you know, I don't necessarily. Uh, it could be tricky if it becomes uh, about you know really uh, a traumatic discussion and <laughs> centers becomes right, a center right. discussion. So, uh, you know, but yes, in general, I think. Um, it look, we're all experiencing this. It's a shared experience to some degree. Um, and so I think it is helpful to, to allow kids to, to talk about it. I think it's helpful for other kids to hear other kids have concerns about it. I think if you, you know, use some, some judgment too, if you have, if you know there's some, some individuals that are very, very concerned and others that you don't necessarily want to transmit that anxiety. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think I would just be um, just aware of that to some degree, but I think generally, I think it's okay. Yeah, today, uh, one of our, what we were talking about was the stars, and when Abraham talked to God, and God told him he would grant his, him as many children as there were stars, and we asked the kids what they would wish for if they were wishing on the stars, and everybody wanted COVID to go away, so that yeah. was, you know, we yeah. had this, we, we kind of were forced into this conversation, and um, it actually was very good, it wasn't... Um, it didn't lead us down a bad path, but right. I just, I was, you know, wanted to be concerned uh, that we weren't yeah. kind of stepping over the lines. No, I don't think so. And I think it, they all hear each other saying the same thing. I think um, mm -hmm. that gives an ease to their, to their uh, concerns to some degree and um, less isolation, less, you know, um, and I think that's, that's helpful when we're having anxiety um, is right. to share it. Uh, okay, good. Good. Thank you. Interesting thing, Brian, about empo empowering the kids. Mm -hmm. My daughter has a three-year-old, and he's very, very smart and very willful, and she tries to give him as much power as she possibly can. One is, you know, when he, she picks him up at our house or whatever, um, he, he doesn't want to leave, obviously, because <laughs> he's having fun. Yeah. But at the same time, she says... Okay, well, we're going to leave in one minute. She says, uh, she says to her phone, she says, set a timer for one minute. And that seems to work with him. And then on the other hand, or not the other hand, she also, when we do naps, her way of doing naps is she tells him, he's three year old, he's kind of needs the nap, and sometimes he doesn't. Um, she just says, it's rest time. You can play or you can sleep. You know, whatever you want to do, but during this time, you need to be resting. And it seems to work for him, but I'd say probably three quarters to, to eight out of 10, he goes to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so she's given him a choice and, and giving him that power to, to do that. And I don't know that we were that great with our kids, <laughs> but it was uh, something that she's done that uh, we really admire. Yeah. I, yeah. Sometimes giving them the options uh, takes away their desire to do the opposite or to, to make one outcome be the, the outcome all the time. So I did put the, a link and I'll email this out too, but I put a link in the chat. If you click on that, it'll go to the Google Drive and it has the handouts that Brian shared, wanted to share with all of you. Yeah, there's some handouts, I think, uh, for kids on screens uh, during COVID and uh, a variety of uh, how to talk to your kids about COVID, things like that. Brian, one thing I wanted to mention is I don't hear anyone talking about the number of kids whose lives are actually better because they've been quarantined, that for families who have two working parents and maybe one or both have been home, and then kids not being in competitive sports and being overly scheduled and in before care and after care for school, what there are kids whose lives are better. Have you yes. noticed that at all? Yeah, and I don't, so I don't see that uh, as much uh, given the population of kids I serve for the most part. Um, I, I definitely have seen that actually to some, in a few cases, um, but, uh, I think there's, uh, people have talked about it and there's some evidence about it. Uh, it, it definitely hits, um, people, uh, in different economic circumstances and different life circumstances differently. And I think that's a lot of what I, um, 
you know, I was, I was reluctant to draw too many conclusions from what I see day in and day out um, globally. I think because it, it is definitely um, much greater stress and much greater uh, struggle for some folks than for, um, for others. And there's definitely the, look, the time of cohesion with, if you have, uh, I've seen it more with adolescents um, that have had a kind of a distant relationship with parents who are really busy and the adolescents are always going out. And there just hasn't been a whole lot of, they have a positive relationship in general, but they don't spend much time together. I think there, I've seen some, and, and it really had some um, parents um, and kids really bond and grow closer over time, over this time. Um, I've also seen, unfortunately, the opposite, where they've had a real, um, anim there's a, a lot of animosity in that relationship, and the kids really just want to leave, and there's a lot of conflict, um, and a lot of it's related to uh, poor mental health of parents and kids, and then now they're stuck together um, for hours upon hours, and, and the parents trying to limit um, exposure. They probably have a grandparent in the home, too, uh, and there's just the increased conflict. Uh, I, unfortunately, I see the, the reverse of it. A great yeah. deal more often, uh, and those those cases are really challenging. I've, I've read about the Swedish approach, and apparently it works there, where they basically don't have any restrictions on anybody except for vulnerable people. And I can't see that working in the U.S. just because we aren't homogeneous. I mean, it's. You know, I think in Sweden, apparently there's fairly homogeneous population. And in our case, um, yeah, I just can't see that working. But I've read that, that young people seem to be, um, there's like a thousand times less chance of, of uh, death versus older people yeah. who are more vulnerable. Yeah, and that's a bit of the... Um... The, the, some of the differences in uh, socioeconomic status and, and uh, single parents and things where um, the, the difference that the, the families are much more interreliant on each other and the, and the risk of transmission amongst the family to vulnerable populations is much greater in those folks. It's harder to distance, it's harder to, um, uh, to make ends meet and get by uh, without those, um, those interactions and without those risks um and that's it i mean it looked at, there's the uh, it's only growing it seems the disparity of of outcomes um and i think that's going to be true in mental health cases uh, as this goes on longer in in the different uh, different more vulnerable groups well thank you for all this information it's been it's been 30 minutes and sure and it was we always appreciate it when you share with us. If you have any questions, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if you yeah, absolutely. send him an email or whatever. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for the first. Thank you, Brian. Sure thing. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian. It. It was excellent. Thanks for organizing it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we'll see you. <laughs> <laughs>